All right, welcome everyone. So today we're very fortunate to have Monish Pabrai here with us at UC Irvine. He is the managing partner of Pabrai Investment Funds, which manages $535 million. If you had invested $100,000 uh, in Pabrai Funds in 1999 when they started, it would be worth a little over $1.1 million today. That's in contrast to if you had invested in the market, you'd have about $285,000. In 2014, uh, Monish founded and raised $150 million for Dondo Holdings, which is a insurance-focused holding company. Um, and last but not least, he is the founder of Dak the Dakshana Foundation, uh, which provides educational opportunities to impoverished uh, but talented children worldwide. So please join me in welcoming our guest for today, Monish Pabrai. Thank you, Thank you uh, Professor Yang. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, yes. All right, great. Well, it's great to be back. And uh, just maybe a quick show of hands. I'm not sure how many of you were here last year. Let me just raise your hand. We've got a brand new audience, good, so we can reuse the same jokes. Which is great. <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, so uh, some of you might have, uh, might have seen the, the talk on YouTube where we focused on Coke last year. And, uh, and so this year we'll try to go uh, further back uh, uh, from the, because co the Coke investment at Berkshire Hathaway came from uh, some of the lessons they learned from Seize Candy, uh, the purchase of Seize Candy in 72, but we'll go further back uh, uh, from there into uh, the, mid, the mid to late 60s and then kind of uh, take it from there. And there are a number of rich lessons uh, in some of the journey uh, that some of these folks took over the, over the years. And, uh, and I think that there's uh, uh, there's a lot of that that can be applied uh, to the likes of uh, yourselves as you embark on your careers and such. Whether or not you become uh, full-time investors, I think it's always good to understand a few things about uh, investing and allocating capital. So uh, I'll go back, uh, you know, into the you know 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, there was a company called uh, uh, SNH Green Stamps, and uh, most of you probably were not born when the SNH green stamps were thriving. Uh, maybe even not even your parents were users of them because it was quite a ways back. Uh, but the SNH green stamps were really the precursor to what uh, today we think of as airline miles. Uh, so it was a kickback mechanism uh, to get loyalty into particular merchants. So for example, if you went to a grocery store, and you spent $50, they would give you one of those stamps for every 10 cents that you spent. And then you'd stick these stamps in these books, and then uh, you could redeem them at various stamp centers for a variety of uh, uh, things, you know, toasters or uh, you know, ra tennis rackets or whatever. So there's a wide range of things you could buy. And so, uh, you know, with humans, kickbacks work. And, uh, and they worked in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and it, they work today. I mean, you know, a lot of the, the way I decide which credit cards I use and so on and so forth is de determined by the miles and the deals uh, that we get probably similar to uh, most of you. And, um, but, but Green Stamps had a policy that uh, in a particular geographic area, let's say for example Irvine, if uh, one particular drugstore offered green stamps, they wouldn't allow competing drugstores to offer it. So they kind of created some exclusivity and it also uh, tended to direct business towards the drugstore that carried and offered these stamps. So the have-not drugstores, if you will, or the have-not grocery stores uh, were not happy about this. And uh, so what they did in response to because they understood that the, the loyalty programs actually boosted sales. Uh, in California, uh, nine different grocers got together and created something called blue chip stamps. 
And uh, so blue chip stamps basically uh, said, we're going to you know, allow anyone who wants to offer these stamps, offer them, any merchant. We're not going to have these, uh, uh, these exclusive type deals. And, um, and so these nine, uh, these nine uh, grocers basically owned blue chip stamps. And, uh, and there were a lot of small merchants who felt like they were kind of shut out of the profit streams that came out of the ownership of blue ship. So they, they felt like, you know, they, hey, you know, we want to own the mothership. Uh, we don't want to just be kind of giving you money every time we get a bunch of stamps to give to our customers. So they sued blue chip uh, for basically saying this is kind of antitrust and it's kind of collusion and all these things. And in the early 60s, that kind of lawsuit uh, wound its way through the court system. And by 1966, the court agreed uh, with, the, uh, with the plaintiffs that they were right and that uh, blue chip should be more equitably held uh, by all the merchants who offered it. So what they forced the company to do was offer uh, ownership stake, shares of blue chip stamps, to all the merchants who uh, were uh, kind of purveyors of these stamps, if you will, and they gave it to them in the proportion of their volume uh, in the last year. So there was a market created uh, for blue chip stamps, and as a result of that market being created, uh, blue chip stamps started trading on uh, the OTC exchange. You know, so you could actually kind of buy and sell shares uh, of blue chip, and. Um, there's a, there's a gentleman, Rick Gurren, who uh, was an early partner of Charlie Munger and, and, uh, and uh, Warren Buffett. He kind of, in LA, reading the newspapers, noticed that all this stuff was happening with blue chip. And uh, he looked at the stock price. And uh, you know, Rick is a very good value investor. And he thought that the, uh, the the price that the stock was being offered at was quite compelling. And so he brought it to the attention of uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And uh, uh, they looked at it as well. But one of the nuances about, about blue chip uh, is that uh, every time uh, the merchants gave uh, these stamps to various uh, you know, buyers of groceries or drugs, whatever else, um, a certain percentage never got redeemed. You know, they kind of go to the back of the drawer or people just forget about them and so on and so forth. And so uh, the blue chip business was very much like the insurance business in the sense that uh, with insurance, you collect premium bought dollars today and then the claims come in sometime in the future and sometimes you can be playing claims even 20, 30 years after uh, you've taken the premium in, in. But in the case of blue chip, it was kind of like traveler's checks where people gave you the money today and sometimes those traveler's checks may not be cashed for a year or two years or three years or never, you know, because they just, they get lost, people never claim them and so on and so forth. So blue chip had float, just like insurance companies have float. Uh, but one of the things about float, the blue chip float was there was a portion of the float that what I would call permanent float. So if you look at the kind of the chart behind me, you see how the revenues of blue chip is going down because it peaked kind of towards the late 60s. And then after that, it kind of started losing its appeal. But you can see the float is multiples of the revenue. And the reason for that is that a certain percentage of the float is permanent in the sense that I don't have the exact number, but I would guess something like 5% of the blue chip stamps that were issued never ever came back for redemption. And in fact, my friend Alex is sitting there with a whole bunch of these blue chip stamps that never came back from redemption. And as a gift for you guys coming today, he's going to give you some stamps. So, uh, you know, keep one packet for yourself and then pass it on to your neighbor, if you will. And um, so there's about approximately 50 or $60 million of these stamps, uh, which are now gradually making their way through Etsy and eBay. 
uh, which never got redeemed, okay? And so in 67, when Rick Gorin looked at this company, the company had about 50 million in equity, uh, which was the, you know, uh, the, the book value of the company. Uh, the stock was trading at 40 million, and they had another approximately about 100 million of OPM, other people's money, that they were holding, which was the float of blue chip. And out of that 100 million, my estimate is something like 50 million of that was never going to be redeemed. So that was kind of like found money. So basically, you were able to buy a company with a dollar of assets for 40 cents. It was, it was available very cheap. And so when Rick Gurren brought it to the attention of uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, and they looked at it, they said, yeah, this is great. Uh, but uh, they also noticed that the way the blue chip float and equities were invested was useless. Uh, you know, the people, these grocers who were on the board uh, really didn't have a clue about investing. And so they knew that they had to uh, basically, in effect, take control uh, of the company and then get control of the investing. So what they did is from 1967 to 1970, over a three-year period, uh, a number of different entities, uh, like the Buffett Partnerships, Warren Buffett personally, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Wheeler Munger Partners, Rick Gorin, and then an entity called Diversified Retailing. All these companies, all these entities together, invested about $24 million, and they got 60% ownership of Blue Chip, and they got control of the company. And first, uh, Charlie Munger went on the board, uh, then Rick Gorin went on the board, and then Warren Buffett. So there were three of them, all three of them on the board. And then they took control of the investment committee and, uh, and sold everything that these guys owned and started to kind of redo uh, everything. And one of the things that happened when they took control was um, one of the entities that bought about six and a half million, about approximately a little more than 25, 27% of, of, of the 60% was a company called Diversified Retailing. So what happened is that uh, uh, Warren Buffett, a guy named Sandy Gottesman who's on the board of Berkshire Hathaway now, and Charlie Munger uh, formed this company called Diversified Retailing. 80% was owned by uh, uh, Buffett and the, Berkshire par uh, the Buffett Partnerships, 10% by Gottesman and 10% by uh, the Wheeler Munger Partnership. And uh, they had, they had uh, raised five and a half million of debt with the help of Goldman Sachs to buy retail operations. And actually they bought a uh, department store in, um, in, uh, in Baltimore. Uh, and and what, what ended up happening with the department store is they realized it was a mistake and they were very lucky about two or three years later to be able to sell it for what they bought it for. But then they had raised this debt. The debt didn't have to be covenants and they took the six and a half million that originally was meant to go to the department store and they put that into blue chip as well. Uh, so basically there was about 18 and a half million of equity and about five and a half million of debt that went in and it became uh, the 60% the of blue chip they controlled. And blue chip with this 24 million they invested had uh, well over 100 million of float and it had another you know, 40, 50 million of equity. So they had a lot of assets that they got control of without spending that much money. And uh, then uh, what they did was that in, uh, in 72, um, C. Scandi uh, came up for sale. And, um, and they took 25 million of blue chips float and they bought C. Scandi. So, I told you about 50, 60 million of the float was never going to be called uh, back because people were never going to. So this was kind of the free money. So they had about 50, 60 million of free money. They took 25 million of the free money, bought these candy. Then uh, a year later, there was a uh, savings and loan that was trading well below liquidation value, sitting at half a book value. 
Wesco Financial, uh, where they again uh, invested about 25 million and bought eventually about 80% of Wesco, uh, again using the float money from Blue Chip. And, uh, and then in 1977, the Buffalo Evening News, which was a newspaper in Buffalo, came up for sale. And uh, that was bought for about 33 and a half million. And from like 72 to 77, C's Candy had generated quite significant retained earnings, about four or five million a year. So they, they used the retained earnings of C's Candy plus some more float from Blue Chip and they bought uh, the Buffalo News. And then the Buffalo News ran into a lot of trouble. So they had uh, five or six years of losses. I think they lost about 12 or 13 million. All of that got covered uh, with, uh, uh, with the earnings from C's Candy. Uh, so they had a lot of union problems, they had strikes, then they got uh, their competitor, sued them because they started a Sunday paper to compete with the uh, other paper in Buffalo. So they went through a lot of turmoil for five or six years of the Buffalo News, but if by 1982, everything had settled down, the competitor had gone out of business, and 82, their earnings were 19 million pre-tax. So on a business they bought for 33 million, uh, five or six years later, you were making almost half of that. And in a few years, the Buffalo News was making 50 million a year pre-tax. So it became a nice home run. So when you look at uh, what happened with blue chip stamps uh, with these, uh, with these uh, three companies, uh, you know, uh, with C's Candy and Vesco Financial, and then the, uh, uh, the Buffalo News, uh, you had about, uh, you know, the original 24 million in effect gave you all these three businesses. And then in 1983, they merged, they merged these businesses uh, into Berkshire Hathaway. And that's how uh, Charlie Munger got to owning one and a half percent of Berkshire Hathaway. Sandy Gosman uh, also got a significant portion and, and so on. And so, uh, every 13 shares of Blue Chip in 83 gave you one share of Berkshire Hathaway, which is now, uh, you know, around a quarter million or so. And uh, the 60% of Blue Chip that costs about 24 million is today sitting at about 60 billion. So it was a very significant uh, increase. But, but when you look at the, you know, I told you that the, about five and a half million was debt. Uh, when they raised from diversified retailing. So the, the group that put the money in from diversified retailing, uh, so every dollar you put into blue chip between 67 and 70, today is worth about $2,500. But every dollar you put in through diversified retailing is worth about $18,000. Uh, and uh, which is why we got a bunch of billionaires out of all of this. And, um, and so that was basically the, uh, the interesting saga with Blue Chip and how it, and the, the original business, Blue Chip itself, uh, went to almost immediate decline. So it, was, it had revenues of about north of 100 million uh, in the late 60s, and by the late 70s, uh, those revenues were down to about 20 million, uh, and then uh, further down, I think in the 80s, it was down to 10 or 20,000 before they, uh, uh, you know, basically shut down the company and such. And then all we have are the remnants, the stamps that all of you've got. Uh, but another, another uh, interesting thing that happened then was that uh, they, bought, uh, they bought Wesco Financial as a very cheap asset for 25 million. It was probably worth, you know, 40, 50 million uh, in 73. And um, almost nothing they did with Vesco moved the needle that much. It wasn't such a great investment. But in 1988, uh, 14, 15 years after they bought Vesco, uh, the government had set up Freddie Mac and they were going to allow public ownership of Freddie Mac shares. You know, uh, Fannie and Freddie were up and running. But they only allowed SNL, saving the loans, to buy Freddie Mac shares. So you had to be an SNL to buy Freddie Mac shares. 
And any SNL could buy, a savings and loan could buy up to 4% of the Freddie Mac shares outstanding. So Wesco owned mutual savings, which was a savings and loan, and they maxed the 4%. So they invested 71 million into Freddie Mac shares. So you make this investment in 73, you do a few things, nothing really moves the needle much. 88, you make a single investment, 71 million. Um, in the year 2000, they sold the Freddie Mac investment. So they sold it for 1.4 billion, went up 20x, plus they had another 600 million in, in dividends, so it became 2 billion. And, and, and then that, uh, that money in, in uh, 2000, if you, you know, moved it to Berkshire at around that time, uh, you know, you would have something like a 4x on that. So, you know, 70 million becomes something like 8 billion. Um, and the key, the key lesson uh, with, the, with all of these stories, if you think about it, from the late 60s to the late 80s, uh, for the most part with these uh, different investments, uh, they made five decisions. Uh, there were five meaningful decisions. So approximately a decision every four or five years. And uh, the five decisions were, you know, taking control of Blue Chip, buying Seas Candy, buying Wesco Financial, buying uh, Buffalo News, and finally uh, the investment in Freddie Mac. So uh, few bets, uh, big bets, and very infrequent bets. And, uh, and so if you, if you think about kind of what, uh, what transpired with, with all these different, uh, uh, with all these different bets is uh, there's a wonderful quote uh, by Charlie Munger which encapsulates this really well. And uh, I'll just read it. It says, uh, a few major opportunities clearly recognizable as, as such, will usually come to one who continuously searches and waits with a curious mind, loving diagnosis involving multiple variables. And then all that is required is a willingness to bet heavily when the odds are extremely favorable, using res resources available as a result of prudence and patience in the past. And uh, so, you know the key the key mantra uh, is this is this few bets, uh, big bets, infrequent bets. Um, that's I think one of the very core tenets of uh, of value investing. But there's another aspect to this which uh, shouldn't get lost in the middle of all this, uh, which is uh, none of this came painlessly. In fact, it came with a lot of pain or uh, as I would say, no pain, no gain. And uh, so Charlie ran the Wheeler Munger Partnership, which was like a hedge fund at the time. And in uh, 1972, 94% uh, of the fund was in two stocks. 61% uh, of the fund was in blue chip and 23% was in something known as the New America Fund. So let me just describe the New America Fund for a second because you understand what's in blue chip because in 72, blue chip uh, was basically, uh, had a market cap of uh, well under 100 million, uh, but had all these assets, you know, with the, the float and such. Uh, the New America Fund was a uh, closed end fund, it was actually originally called a fund of letters. So, uh, a bunch of kind of uh, flamboyant businessmen with the help of some brokers raised about $60 million. The brokers took about 10% of that to raise the money. So off the bat, the investors lost 10%. So there was 54 million left in the fund. And then they started to invest it. Uh, and they didn't do a very good job of investing it. So what began at $10 a unit uh, and then because the quality of investments was so bad, that fund started trading at a significant discount to underlying intrinsic value. So you could, you know, like if, if you look at 
Uh, I don't know if you've discussed closed-end funds. So if you, if you open Barron's or even, even just go Google closed-end funds, you'll see there are thousands of these funds where unlike typical mutual funds or ETFs, uh, they raise a fixed amount of money. And, and after that, they trade like stocks. And sometimes you get a variance between the assets in the fund and the trading price. It can either sometimes trade at a premium, and sometimes you can trade at a discount, and sometimes the discounts can get pretty wide. So one can actually build a nice little career out of, in effect, buying closed-end funds and waiting for them to uh, kind of get back on track. But um, so the new, the, the fund of letters had dropped quite a bit in value and uh, well below the, the underlying assets. So uh, Charlie Munger and Rick Gorin bought enough of the units to get uh, on the board and then take control of the fund. So again, they got control of 60 million or 50 million in assets with just a few million dollars invested. And once they got control of the fund, they again liquidated the investments and started redeploying the money more intelligently. And um, so in 72, uh, and they renamed it, they renamed it the New America Fund. 72, the New America Fund had, had a net asset value of $9.18. And by the end of 74, it had a value of $9.28, actually went up. But the, the price it was trading at was $3.75. It dropped a lot because 72, 74 was when we had the Nixon impeachment and you know, all these price controls. We had a lot of uh, the, the oil embargoes and such. There was a lot of ugliness going on at that time in the uh, US economy. And the stock market had crashed. And uh, so uh, blue chip stamps, which had a market cap of not of 80 million in 72, by the end of 74 was trading at a market cap of 27 million. So if you just think about blue chip stamps at the end of 74, it already owned C's Candy, which they had bought for 25 million, and it also owned Wesco Financial that they had bought for also 25 million, both seriously undervalued. Even then, the, uh, the market was not willing to recognize that these were great assets. So the uh, Munger, uh, Wheeler Munger Partnership uh, reported over a two year period about a 53% drop in returns. It was, the, it was a huge, huge drop and um, a lot of pain. In fact, uh, Charlie Munger recalls that uh, time as a very painful time. So, what he did is in 1975, I think 1975 the fund was up about 75%, but if you're down 50%, and then up 75%, you're still not back up to zero. Uh, you know, if you're down 50%, you need to be up 100% uh, and such. So, uh, so what he did was he uh, liquidated the partnership. Uh, but what, what he also did when he liquidated was he distributed uh, blue chip stamps and New America Fund to all the investors. So instead of giving them cash, he gave them these stocks and, just, and he just gave them instructions that listen, just hold on to these stocks. And eventually, um, uh, the New America Fund was eventually liquidated in 1986 for $100 per unit. So what was trading at less than $4 a unit went up 25 times. Uh, one of the companies they bought inside New America was the Daily Journal. So they bought uh, the Daily Journal for $2 million inside the New America Fund. And then in 86, when they liquidated New America Fund, the Daily Journal started trading uh, on the over-the-counter, now trades on the New York Stock Exchange. And that $2 million in the Daily Journal is today worth almost $300 million. Uh, so that's also done quite well. Uh, but, but you know, the thing is, while these assets did well, uh, we had a period of serious pain uh, where you had huge declines. And if you think about it, his, his investments were the most sensible investments he could make because he was buying, he had 94% of his uh, investments in two companies in which he had control, knew the businesses really well, and they were trading at a huge discount. Even then, uh, you had a lot of pain. 
And, um, and so that's the, uh, that's the other facet uh, that one has to keep in mind is that none of these things uh, come, come, that at, come that easily. And then, you know, um, some of you might think that these are stories which are so far back, uh, different times, these times don't exist today. How can we take advantage of these things today uh, and such? So in, 2000, in 2002, uh, Charlie Munger made an investment that he, he read about in, uh, in Barron's, and Barron's is a weekly magazine, and uh, he had been reading Barron's for almost half a century. Uh, so every, every issue of Barron's probably has at least 10 stock tips. And uh, so if, you, if you're going to read them for half a century or something, uh, that's about 2,500 issues or about 25,000 stock tips. After 50 years of reading Barron's, he made one investment. And that investment was in 2002, where he invested $10 million in Tenneco. Uh, and Tenneco invested in the stock, as well as uh, their, their bonds were 35 cents on the dollar, and then they converted uh, to stocks as well. And, uh, and he sold Tenneco a couple of years later, and the 10 million had become about 80 million. Uh, it was about 8x. Uh, 2004, 2005, and, uh, and then he turned around, he'd met a promising young Asian manager, Lee Lu, and he gave the 80 million to Lee Lu to invest in a new fund Lee Lu was starting to invest in Asia, uh, primarily, and uh, that 80 million, I don't know the exact number, but it's something like 500 million today, it's gone up, uh, you know, six or seven times uh, since then. So if you think about it, um, you know, you have one action in 2002 to buy Tenneco. Uh, you have a second action in 2005 or 2006 to give that, the proceeds to Li Lu. And you end up, the 10 million becomes 500 million, 50x uh, in the last 15 years. Uh, and these are 15 years that we were all alive. We could have done the same thing. Uh, I certainly didn't do the same thing, which is why here I'm talking to you instead of, you know, uh, being up there on the slide. Uh, but, but the thing is that it again, it again demonstrates uh, the, the importance of making bets when the odds are heavily in your favor. Uh, Charlie was sure because Tenneco had all these very dominant brands uh, with uh, uh, Monroe struts and mufflers and brakes, which are all now waning, but at that time they were uh, quite prominent. And, uh, and, and in fact, if he had held on, he was buying this stock for you know, $1.50, $1.75, it eventually went to $55 a share. So even if he had just held on some more, he would have made even more than what he did. And so the, the interesting thing is that you go through a multi-decade period of listening to one pitch after another and do nothing, then you step in and uh, make, make, one, make one investment, and then um, you step in and make another investment. And so in Charlie's words, the 500 million with Li Lu pretty much came out of nothing. And, um, and if you think about, uh, you know, in 2002, uh, I, think, I think Charlie was a billionaire by then. Uh, so, so 10 million that he put in would kind of been like 1% of his net worth. And uh, uh, Rick Gurren likes to say that it's always good to keep 10 million in checking in case something shows up. So I would kind of rephrase that as saying that it's always good to have maybe 1, 2, or 5% or some single digit percent of your net worth sitting there uh, waiting to be deployed uh, when, when you have extreme odds in your favor with very high return possibilities. And they, they will show up from time to time. Uh, they show up infrequently, and one has to be prepared to act in size when that happens. And uh, so these were some of the thoughts I, I really wanted to share with you, which is, uh, you know, the core is, uh, you know, the few bets, big bets, infrequent bets, um, the ability to take pain, 
and, uh, and the ability to, uh, uh, to be decisive uh, at the points when you're, you're encountering no-brainers. And uh, so with that, uh, Professor Yang, you can maybe open up for questions and such. Um, so regarding your, your point about the ability to take pain, right, so that's very closely related to this idea of uh, the limits to arbitrage, right, that uh, when you purchase an investment, you have to be financed appropriately because the investment can go the wrong way before it goes the right way. And I'm wondering in, in your position, so you, you run a fund uh, or buy funds, uh, you also run an insurance or an insurance focused holding company, Dando Holdings. In your uh, investment fund, there is the ability of investors to redeem uh, once a year. Uh, whereas in your uh, insurance company, you have locked up capital, um, sort of closer to the closed end fund example you gave. And so I'm wondering, when you think about investments, uh, do you think about you know, these two pools of money have different uh, maturity in terms of their liability structure? Right? So the Probi funds, sort of a one year period and the insurance company longer period. How do you think about you know, which types of investments go in which fund, uh, which, which pool of money uh, to deal with this ability to take pain problem you mentioned? Sure, I think that's a good question. Well, I think that uh, Dando, Dando Holdings, uh, uh, you're correct, is like, it's like a closed-end fund, if you will. And inside Dando, we can own private assets. So for example, our insurance company is wholly owned, it's a private company. And we have a couple other private assets like that. We cannot do that in Fabri funds because it's subject to annual redemptions. Um, but other than that difference, I mean, I think that there's a couple of differences. I think the, uh, so Pabrai funds is purely public equities, uh, which are liquid and, and such. And if people are uh, redeeming capital, they have to give us some notice and you know, we can kind of get ready and, and arrange for that, not a problem. Uh, in the case of Thando, we've got a couple of layers. So we've got investments inside the insurance company and that is very highly regulated capital. So uh, we are regulated uh, by the, uh, the state insurance regulators. And, and we also have rating agencies that have uh, various kind of mandates and uh, suggestions in terms of how we might want to structure things. So uh, there are rightfully so a lot of restrictions on what and how we can invest uh, inside the insurance company. Um, Fabri funds has a lot fewer restrictions, uh, but the biggest restriction would be uh, that it needs to be all be liquid. And uh, so they're different, they're different rules, uh, but we can, we can uh, you know, certain things can only happen in one vehicle. Some can happen in both vehicles, and we just kind of, I just kind of uh, play with it as, as it comes, if you will, so. <coughs> Um, so my name is Kevin. I am currently a full-time MBA student here at the Paul Mirage School of Business. Um, so one of the biggest takeaways I got from your presentation is that it takes an inordinate amount of patience in order to find out what are the good investments to undertake in, as by your example um, of the individual who looked through 50 years and made one investments um, within those 50 years. So uh, for millennials such as myself who are used to the generation of smartphones and digital apps who maybe don't necessarily possess you know, that type of patience, um, which is probably something that may be developed, I'm not really sure, what are some um, tips or, or what, are, what are some words of wisdom that you would have um, for those within the millennial generation who would like to adopt this type of approach? Sure, all right, that's a good question. So uh, what I would say is, uh, you know, I think investing is a great activity uh, for a gentleman or lady of leisure, if you will. Uh, you should have something else that is your uh, primary vocation, if you will, and this becomes secondary. Uh, I think it works really well when you don't have to uh, think about, oh, I haven't done anything last week or the week before, and what am I doing? Uh, so one way you can, you can skin that 
is um, you can get all the hyperactivity out of your system uh, by being involved in fast-moving startups, for example. You know, you could you could uh, you could do any any you could have a, a day job um, which satisfies those cravings of you know lots of action and activity. Uh, but in your investing world, uh, I think there is no way around the fact that uh, uh, patience is almost a, it's like a law of physics in investing. Uh, it's unlikely that one can develop a great track record as an investor if one is hyperactive. I think the two kind of uh, don't, uh, don't jive with each other. Uh, there are periods of time when lots of investments become available or certain sectors become attractive and such. And there are many periods of time when there's not much to do. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, investing is a great activity uh, if you have something else that takes away all your cravings for action. Um, and, and it's very important to, I think it's a very important thing that if you're, um, it's also an activity that probably to some extent is probably, uh, there's some genetic predis predisposition. If your genetic predisposition is of a hyperactive trader, uh, you're probably not going to have an easy time uh, sitting there like Charlie Munger just reading without doing anything. Uh, but if you're, if you're predisposed uh, to just being a, a thoughtful person who doesn't particularly crave action, uh, then I think it can be uh, a huge positive. So it's not easy to uh, be on this path. Um, one of the reasons uh, I wanted to give this talk is I wanted to pound these ideas into my head uh, to get uh, to being more patient than I am. Uh, because I think that I have not practiced this degree of patience in my career. And I think if I were to be more patient, uh, I think the, the results would be better. So I don't have an easy answer for you. I would just say split your time into two buckets, the hyperactive bucket to get all that hyperactivity out of the picture and then have this uh, second thing on the side, which is um, reading and waiting. So, Thank right. you. Sure. Uh, the question is, you, you talked about a few bets, big bets, infrequent bets, and as you know, today the markets are, if you consider one side, they're saying it's extremely bullish, you know, where we are today, you know, we are at the tops. Maybe there is still some growth left, but I mean, are there opportunities like that in today's marketplace? And, and if there are, where would, let's say, the students or the ones with uh, meager means, you know, I'm talking about $1,000, $5,000 invest, where would they put that money? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, well, I I hope to I I hate to quote Jim Cramer, uh, but Jim Cramer has a great quote. There's always a bull market somewhere. Um, so there are even if you just look at uh, publicly traded equities, uh, there are probably a hundred thousand stocks around the globe that are publicly traded, and um, there are uh, probably several thousand of them, or maybe at least several hundred of them, uh, that are in one way or another trading significantly below intrinsic value. And um, so in many ways, it's a treasure hunt. Uh, or, or like Munger would say, why should it be easy to get rich? Uh, but, but I think that if, if one were intensely focused uh, on that, uh, one would get there. So I'll just give you a, a story from, um, uh, from Warren Buffett's uh, childhood when he was a teenager. Uh, so when he was a teenager in Omaha, he used to go to the, the horse racetrack. Um, it was called the Aksarban racetrack. It's Nebraska spelled backwards. And, um, and he'd, he'd go after all the races had finished, and he'd collect all the tickets that people had left on the ground, which were all the losing tickets. And he'd collect them all, and then he'd carefully go through each one 
to see if some drunk had discarded a winning ticket. And, uh, and once in a while, he'd, he'd usually find one, two, three, or a few tickets that were actual winning tickets that had been tossed. And then because he was underage, he sent his Aunt Alice to the window to collect. And, and then, you know, he put that money away, and the next Sunday he was again there uh, to uh, collect his winning tickets. And, um, and so uh, those were free lunches, right? I mean, there was some effort involved. But for a kid, uh, it was a free lunch, if you will. And when he was about uh, 21 years old, um, Buffett uh, went through uh, something known as the Moody's Manual. So these Moody's Manuals uh, covered a number of different industries. Uh, they were about 20,000 pages in all, and they came out every year. So he said that in 1951, he went through all 20,000 pages in these manuals twice, right? So in a year, uh, say 2,000 working hours, probably for Warren, 4,000 working hours, uh, he'd, he'd gone through 20,000 pages now, or 40,000 pages. Now, if you're going through 40,000 pages, uh, how many pages is that per day? If you have, uh, let's say you had 400, uh, 400 days, so uh, what would it be, like 1,000? Uh, no, it'd be 100 pages a day, right? It'd be approximately 100 pages a day. Not that much, you can do it, 100 pages is not that much. And what he was doing, even 100 pages a day, you're going pretty fast. And he was going fast. So he, he was going through those 100 pages a day the exact same way he went through the Exarban tickets. You can take the kid out of Exarban. You cannot, you cannot take Exarban out of the kid. OK? So what was he looking for? Well, so for example, he, he found, uh, I think he was saying page, uh, 1433, Western Insurance. Uh, two years back, they made $22 a share. And then last year, they made $29 a share. And the stock was uh, between 3 and 13 was the range for the last 52 weeks. And they had $135 in book value. OK? So for him, Western Insurance was identical to uh, the exarban ticket that the drunk had tossed. Um, it shouldn't be there, right? Western insurance should not be trading at a range of 3 to 13. And then he said, he saw Western insurance, he stopped. You know, he's flipping pages, stops. Pulls up the AM Best manual, which is the insurance manual for insurance companies. Looks at it, he says, there's nothing wrong with it. Talked to a couple of insurance brokers, they said, the company's fine he puts some money into Western Insurance. He said 10 pages later, he finds uh, another insurance, North American uh, something, surety or, or casualty or something. Again, very similar numbers and such. And then he says the book really got hot and heavy towards the end. You know, there were all these exciting things going on. And, um, and uh, in, um, in 2011, uh, so this was 1951, right? Uh, and then the Sarban escapades were taking place probably around 1943 or something, when he was 13, 14 years old. Uh, 2011, my friend Guy Spear and I were visiting Warren, and we were in his office, in his private office. And I noticed there was a book on his desk, and it was called the Japan Company Handbook. And I was very familiar with the Japan Company Handbook because at that time, Guy Spear and I were leafing through that book uh, looking for Japanese net nets, very cheap Japanese stock. The problem is that when you, when you find, and it's in English, which is great, uh, when you find those, those stocks, uh, you'd be lucky to get half a million dollars into it or $100,000 into it. I mean, it was, these are small, thinly traded Japanese companies. But, but the thing is, the Jap Japanese company I handbook was about 600 pages, two stocks per page. Um, so I see it on his desk, and I said, Warren, what are you doing fooling around with the Japan Company Handbook? I mean, Berkshire Hathaway, you're deploying hundreds of billions of dollars. There's nothing in that book that's going to help Berkshire Hathaway, okay? Because this, this is Mickey Mouse stuff. And so, of course, he's a poker player. He 
his expression doesn't give away anything. So then I picked up the book and I, I took it to some pages which I knew the stocks that I had found. That were, I said, Warren, let me make this faster for you. You know, here's some Mayashi Corp, whatever else. And without asking him, I dog-eared a bunch of his pages in his book, mutilated his book and gave it back to him. And again, poker face, he doesn't, you know, uh, say anything. And, uh, but what he was doing is he was probably going through that more for his personal account and more importantly, the reason he was going through it, because you can get a carbon out of the kid. He still loves the treasure hunt. Okay, so he can put money into those things, but he loves the hunt. In 2006, he told MBA students he did the same thing with a, uh, some, uh, uh, a booklet someone sent him, uh, City Corp had put this booklet together of Korean stocks. And he found, uh, he made 20 investments off of companies in that book on one Sunday afternoon. He put 100 million of his personal funds into 20 stocks from that book. And um, so for example, one of the companies he invested in was uh, Dehan Flower. Dehan Flower in Korea is uh, got one fourth of the flower market. market you know, people have to have to eat, and um, it was uh, trading for uh, thirty five thousand won. Uh, the last three years' earnings were like between eighteen and twenty five thousand won, and it had a hundred thousand won in cash and investments and no debt. So it's at one third of liquidation value. If there's no business, and on top of that, there's a business, right? And uh, so. So, coming back to your question about what do I do with 5,000? Well, quite frankly, the, um, the 5,000 is a huge advantage. Uh, Buffett has a disadvantage at 400 billion. That's a problem. 5,000 is not a problem. So, the question is, are you willing to be like the kid at Exarbon? Are you willing to flip through 40,000 pages looking at six numbers per page to see whether you should flip the page or wait. And so with 100,000 stocks in the world and auction-driven <coughs> markets, uh, there are always mispriced securities. And not only are they mispriced, uh, in some cases they are extremely mispriced. Uh, two years back, uh, someone sent me a uh, a stock tip. And you know, usually when I come into work, one of the good things is that every day when I come into work, uh, usually uh, my assistants hand me a folder and there are usually two or three stock tips in there. Okay, it's great. Uh, my email address, uh, mp at pabraifunds.com, please feel free. Okay, so every, every day I come into work, I look at my my folder, and there they are, you know, two or three stocks I've never heard of that people have sent in. And I just look at two numbers, and then it goes in the garbage. But before I send the garbage, thanks a lot, uh, you know, appreciate, appreciate your sending it. But I look at two numbers. I look at the price the stock is trading at, which is normally mentioned in there, and the price the person is saying it should be trading at, right? If those two numbers are not apart by at least a factor of five or 10, I'm done. So unfortunately, every day when I come in, this is what happens. Some guy has sent me a 15-page elegant write-up, uh, immaculately done, a lot of charts, etc. I'm just looking for these two numbers. The stock's at 13, and after 10 pages, it says it's <laughs> worth 18. What do you think I do, Sanjay? Thank you very much, warm regards. Uh, and, but the, the, don't let that dissuade you. All I want to say to you, please don't send it to me unless it's at least a 5x, and preferably a 10x, and ideally a 100x delta between those two numbers. <laughs> because you know, we need to, we need to get to 10 right? right? But, but the thing is, almost exactly two years ago, some person I'd never interacted with, sent this 10-page, very well-written report. I looked at the two numbers.
the two numbers were apart by a 10x. I said, lo and behold, someone has sent this in, right? I said, this is great. So I have a, like a Eckhorn's easy chair in my office. You know, Lynn knows my office, the Eckhorn's. I left my desk. I went to my Eckhorn's easy chair, put my feet up, and started to read the report. Because now I was into an orgasmic experience. I wanted to make sure I fully <laughs> enjoy the experience. And uh, I, I read the report, and I couldn't find anything wrong with it. I mean, everything, I'd never heard of this company, but assuming everything he was saying was accurate, because I didn't know whether it was accurate or not, all I knew was he was describing some company and blah, 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 whatever else, and then there was this factor of 10 delta. I said, okay, the fairy tale looks awesome. Now let's see if the fairy tale is true. So I just, all I did was I spent about two hours just checking every number. I just opened up Google Finance and opened up a few other websites and I just went through the company's website and I just checked, okay, he's saying debt is so much, is the debt so much? It's non-recourse, is it non-recourse, blah, blah, blah. I just went through the checks and after two hours I looked and said, I'm done. Everything is there, there's nothing more to do. And uh, I put 20 million of Pabrai funds into the company. Uh, it's, it's now at, I think, north of 50 million. And I, I think we probably will get 100, maybe north of 100, might even get 200 million out of it. We'll see. Uh, and you know, uh, the guy who sent it, I still haven't met him. I did thank him. And I said, please keep them coming. And uh, I haven't heard, I haven't seen anything else from him. But if I see something from him, I'll definitely go back to my account share to read what else he has to say. So the, the bottom line is that uh, if one were to be unreasonable and say I only want 10 baggers or 5 baggers or whatever else, uh, they're going to show up. If, as long as you're willing to be patient and be, un and be unreasonable about it. Uh, but the thing is what it takes, it takes the, insert, it, uh, the intensity of the person at Aksarban. You know, that's, that's a very unusual teenager who's doing that. And that's a very unusual 21 year old who's doing that. I don't know any, uh, I don't know any investment analysts who pound through 40,000 pages. Maybe they do, but I don't know them. You know, and, and who, who are going through to the intensity that Buffett went through. And, and one, of the, one of the things is that, you know, Einstein used to say, that compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. And the reason he said that is that, so Sanjay, if you have $1,000 and you find one of these five baggers, uh, let's say even every 10 years, right? And you start at the age of 20 and you're dead at the age of 80, for example. So you've got six decades, right? Every decade, uh, your money multiplies 5x. So 5,000 becomes 25,000 when you're 30. It becomes 125,000 when you're 40. And it becomes 625,000 when you're 50. It becomes a little over 3 million when you're 60. It becomes 15 million when you're 70. And you've got 75 million when you're 80 and dead. And that's of that's $1,000 or $5,000, right? So. We don't need, this is the magic of compounding, is can you find one five-bagger every 10 years? Uh, you've got, you know, at least 20,000 hours in 10 years if you just work 40 hours a week to find one. Uh, one should be able to find one. Uh, so that's the name of the game. Other questions? If the students are sets. Uh, of the work involved. In the Japan example, uh, where you were looking at very cheaply priced Japanese stocks, uh, I imagine you must have looked at a bunch of perhaps other countries or uh, elsewhere in the Japanese market. So how many pages or how many hours of work would you say went into for every one idea that came out to be? Well, promised? so the thing, the thing is that the Japan, uh, well, I, I was interested in looking at Japan because at the time, you know, if you, if you just looked a little bit at the, at the 
the Nikkei and what had happened to it. I mean, it's gone through a long period of doing nothing, you know. And uh, Japanese companies have governance issues. They sit a lot of cash. They don't give it out. There's, there, there are definite negatives there. But cheapness gets over a lot of negatives. Uh, so there are faster ways to do that. Uh, I could do exactly what I was doing with the Japan Company hand, hand, Handbook with Capital IQ. Uh, that's, I think, I don't know, 18,000 a year or something. But if I use Capital IQ, uh, which is how I'd actually got to the company that marked in Warren's book, is I had actually taken a shortcut. And then I tried to get Warren to get interested in Capital IQ. He had no interest. I think the reason he had no interest, he just loved the treasure hunt and, and such. So, um, so uh, it, didn't, it didn't take that long. Um, you know, the, this is the funny thing about, about, the, about the market. So those, those bargains should not exist. You know, you have some portion of your time in the class that goes on efficient markets, you know. If markets are fully efficient, these things just shouldn't exist. You know, it's a classic, like the University of Chicago, the professor's walking, his student points out there's a $100 bill on the ground. He says, that's not a real $100 bill because if it was a real $100 bill, it wouldn't be on the ground. And so markets are almost fully efficient, but they're not fully efficient. And there's a huge gap um, between those two statements. And Buffett has a saying that I'd be a bum on the street with a tin cup with, if markets were efficient. So um, it is not so much, uh, I don't think it, it would take that much time. I think it's a question of whether one has the fortitude to buy, because you're going to be buying things that you've never heard of, companies you've never heard of, who its stock prices haven't moved in a long time. Uh, you would have to sit there and watch paint dry for many years. Are you the kind of person who loves to watch paint dry? How many people love to watch paint dry? Please raise your hand. Alex loves to, he's in the real estate business. He paints the wall and just sits there and watches. Is that what you do, Alex? All right, okay. So if you love to watch paint dry, which the millennials I take are not too keen on, but if you love to watch paint dry, this is the field for you. Because that's what you gotta do. You gotta make your bets and then spend your time talking to students so that the time is spent and you don't do counterproductive activities. So, other questions? So I'm former VC and currently investment banker. I'm a big fan of Monish since I was doing my CFA. So great to see you speak here. Um, you know, the business I am in, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the product and technology and where it's going. And we don't get to see as much past financials and, and find those things, right? So when you gave these wonderful examples, you know, loved it, the blue chip and Taneco and those, and even, you know, the Moody's Manual and Japan Company book and, and how you kind of pin it down to a couple financial ratios or multiples and figure that one out. But when, like, Charlie figured out Taneco or they figured out, you know, Buffett and Tim, um, uh, Blue Chip, and when you do your work, how much, once you find that five-bagger or ten-bagger, uh, how much work goes into like looking at the product or the business itself besides just the financials, right? And because you look across so many sectors, and like me, you can't, one cannot be expert of all the sectors, sure. right? So, so what role does that play, if at all? Or yeah. it's purely financial decision? No, no, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, the answer is there's a wide variance. Uh, in, uh, in some cases, uh, the time spent is very short. Uh, I would say that with the, with, the, with the tip that individual sent me, it didn't take much time. And, and the, one of the reasons it didn't take much time was, uh, was that the quality of that report was extremely high. And actually what I discovered, because I was really blown away with the high quality of that report. So I'll answer your question, but just to give you some, uh, a little bit of a kind of backdrop. So I never talked to that company or interacted with them in any way uh, when, I, when I bought the position. Uh, very recently, I went 
and uh, I was in the same city as a company. I said, let's go meet them. You know, let's see what's happening, right? And so I arranged a, a meeting, and uh, uh, the, the CEO wasn't there, but the CFO was there. And this was after you made the investment? A couple of years after I made the investment, right? And so I go in, uh, and you know, we own uh, close to 10% of the company. So we're, we're one of the largest owners of the stock outside of the, uh, the family that controls it. And um, so I meet the, the CFO for the first time. He says, you know, Monish, all these years, all these people have been badgering me about why you invested in our stock. And I kept trying to explain to them, I've never interacted with this guy. Okay, I've, I've never had any interaction, and they don't believe me. They don't believe that someone would take a 10% position in a company without ever having met them. So they, they think I'm kind of lying to them. But I, I told them there's nothing there. And I, I explained to him that I had received this, uh, you know, very well-written thing. And what ended up happening is that he gave me some data that completed the picture. So there was, a, um, there was an Italian analyst this, this is a company based in Hyderabad in India. Uh, this Italian analyst who I've also never met uh, visited the CFO probably, uh, or visited the CEO and CFO in, the, in Hyderabad probably four times over two or three years doing a very detailed drill down on the business. And he was really uh, going back several years before I bought the, the company. And then he put together a write-up. I haven't seen that write-up till later, and, uh, and then this other individual took that right up and then built on it, right? So by the time I got involved, I had these two great unpaid analysts uh, who had done a phenomenal job, and, uh, and uh, it, it worked out well. And so in that particular case, because so many of the pieces were kind of put in place for me, uh, there wasn't much, I didn't need to spend much time. Others had spent hundreds of hours on it, uh, to, to make it uh, easier for me, so thank you very much. Uh, but, but you know, uh, I was, I would say about five years ago, I was looking at the auto industry, which I always hated. And, um, and in that case, it took me, I think, probably about two months of, you know, staying up till three or four in the morning reading uh, to finally uh, get to the point that I was ready to make an investment. So in that case, it took, uh, significant amount of time. Uh, probably the most time it's, they get to hundreds of, hours, hundreds of hours to get to where we need to get to. So there's a range. Um, if you were going to build a basket of Japanese net nets, that probably wouldn't take you that much time. You probably wouldn't want, need to spend even more than 30 minutes on a company. And also you would probably make the bet size really small. And you'd make a bet with 10, 15, or 20 companies. You'd kind of make a basket bet. And you could do that. And uh, even today, uh, you know, if you look at, for example, uh, the South Korean market, uh, the South Korean market today is probably one of the cheapest markets in the world, according to me. I think the smaller cap Indian market and the South Korean markets are, are relatively cheap. But South Korea has these preferreds, and there are lots of them. They trade at huge discounts to the common, the only difference is the voting rights, which really don't matter. Uh, and, and so, uh, in some cases, the preferreds are trading at one third of the common, when economically they're identical. And this is in 2017, uh, when it shouldn't be happening, but it is happening, and it's happening right now. So, uh, so there are, uh, I would say that there's a range. Uh, sometimes it takes a lot of time, sometimes it takes little time. And uh, it's just, uh, Wherever it falls, you know, so that's, that's perfectly fine, so. Uh, hi there, my name is uh, Wally Splain. I'm an undergraduate here. Uh, so I was wondering if you could speak to the uh, value of your philanthropic efforts and uh, why it was important for you to form the Dokshana Foundation. Okay, well, great. Uh, well, I think it was just uh, because there was no other choice. Uh, so if you... Uh, you know, I think that if you, if you are even a uh, slightly above average inve investor uh, spending less than you earn over a lifetime, uh, you're going to end up with probably more assets than you can spend. 
And I could see that that, that was uh, happening and probably likely to continue to happen uh, in, in my family's case. And so if you're going to end up with more assets than you're consuming, uh, then there are really only two choices left, right? You can either pass it on to your gene pool uh, or you can in some way uh, recycle it back to society. Those are pr pretty much the only things you can do. And um, large inheritances are a disservice to uh, my kids, if you will, uh, the next generation, if you will. I think that if I were to give my kids large inheritances, uh, they would have probably less interesting lives than they might otherwise. Uh, so, so it is actually a bad idea uh, to be thinking about passing on large inheritances. And so if large inheritances is not an option, then the only option you have left is to recycle back to society. And one of the things I, I realized is that, uh, from really from reading Warren Buffett's perspectives, is that giving money away effectively is more difficult than making it. Uh, because the types of things, you know, if I'm going to make an investment, I can look at 100,000 stocks and find something that's kind of weird and no one likes or whatever else and make that investment. But if I'm going to try to improve society, you know, the kinds of things I have to work on are things like poverty or, you know, environment or health. And these are problems and issues that have been intractable in getting solved even with trillions of dollars being spent by uh, various entities, governments and such. These are tough problems. And um, so understanding that giving money away is more difficult than making it, I didn't want to wait till I was very old before starting to kind of figure it out, if you will. So uh, we started Dakshana, my wife and I started Dakshana about, uh, I think about 11 years ago. Uh, I was in my early 40s then. And the reason to start then was to really have at least 10 years where we could fail, but learn from those failures and then uh, start getting better. So that was the idea is that uh, we started giving away 2% of our net worth, I think about 10 years ago. And uh, it was a small number that wouldn't affect us if it didn't work but it will give us enough money to have meaningful experimentation. And what ended up happening was that uh, we didn't have um, really any uh, meaningful period of not having traction. It took off right away. And, uh, and we were very lucky. We got a great partnership with the government of India, uh, got a great team, and, uh, and it, it took off quite well. And uh, so now it's... Um, uh, it's way past a startup, it's getting to scale and such, and so, uh, and we've, we had opened it in the middle to others to contribute, so I think uh, Dakshana now, for example, has an annual budget of uh, a little over $3 million, about half of that comes from my family, the other half is coming uh, from other folks, and, uh, and that number will keep growing, so it's become it's actually created meaningful change for a significant number of people, so it's worked out. And so that was the kind of the thinking, was that there was really no choice. And now I think the, uh, the goal will be over time to gradually kind of increase uh, the percentages and the numbers and so on and uh, see. But, but the thing is that what I've always assumed with philanthropy is be very willing to fail. So in many ways, it's the opposite of investing. Uh, what one ought to be doing uh, with philanthropy is to swing hard at the fences. Uh, swing for the fences even if the odds are that you'll miss. Uh, because it's the, really the only way you can kind of bend the trajectory. Uh, and that's what if you look at like for example the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you know they're trying to swing for these things like um, the vaccines for mal malaria or uh, hundreds of millions of toilets and so on in India. So they're, they're, they're trying to uh, go after major things uh, with some significant innovations, knowing that there's a high chance of failure. 
Uh, but the good news is that if you succeed, uh, then you move the trajectory, which is great. So, so that was the kind of the thinking behind it. Um, so one of the takeaways that I got from your presentation with regarding the uh, blue chips, um, where about 50% of people don't ever redeem their tickets was that, you know, that's one of the habits that, you know, people have um, by going through that experience and within the industry you can sort of define that as like a core element and a, and a core result of the business. So um, I sort of take that back to when I think about learning about value investing in my class, um, in my classroom setting, which is that, um, you know, before undertaking any type of investment, you have to like really, really know the business inside out, like the core about how it operates, um, how does it um, generate and maintain profitability, so on and so forth. And so I was wondering from your point of view, how does that approach really take place when we look at a diversified business or like a conglomerate? Um, like take for example, GE as a large company that really diversifies into many, many verticals. How would you really take the principles of value investing and put it onto a large company with that kind of diversification? Sure, that's a great question. So first of all, for blue chip, the percentage not redeemed, I think was closer to 5%. Uh, half of humanity was not out to lunch. <laughs> just, a, just about a few percentage, four or 5%. And uh, now those four or 5% are selling it on eBay and trying to make up for it, so it's okay. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, Buffett has a, uh, a, a box on his desk uh, which says too hard on it. And so he says that uh, probably 98% of stuff he encounters goes into the too hard pile, which means it's something he cannot figure out. And, um, and he's a very smart guy. And so uh, the, the thing is, uh, we don't need to know everything about everything. So, for example, you know, the gentleman here mentioned venture capital and early stage investments and all of that. Uh, you can get a lot of moonshots with that approach. You can also get a lot of zeros, right? Um, not an easy game. So, for me, uh, I would just take that whole thing and put it in a too hard file for me. Uh, for him, it's not the case because he's got some competence and such. So this varies by individual. So if I look at GE, uh, here's the reasons why I would just not even spend two seconds on it. So number one, it's probably followed by two dozen analysts um, who spend a lot of time on GE. Um, and I can look at any of their reports and I can see that there's no factor of five or ten between the current share price and what the share price is. In fact, I would say that's probably the case of the thousand largest businesses in the US. Forget about them. So if the company's in the Fortune 500 or the S&P 500, whatever else, we're done. The beautiful part is we just finished 500 businesses in two seconds. It's awesome. You, you like my speed? I, I have great speed. You know, I'm faster than Buffett can flip pages. Uh, so, um, so we don't need to understand everything about everything. Uh, we can just focus on, uh, you know, uh, Munger says, go fishing where the fish are. Are there fish in the Fortune 500? Uh, maybe if I spent 10 years, I might find a couple of fish there that I might have missed. But, you know, let's keep it simple and just say no and move on. Uh, so basically, uh, focus on where the fish are, focus on uh, sectors that people hate, uh, unloved, countries that are unloved, uh, you know, things that would cause distress. For example, uh, Qatar has been in the news lately. Have you looked at stocks in Qatar? You know, uh, maybe if you're doing nothing tonight, uh, you know, uh, the, the stock market is tanking. And I haven't looked at the Qatar stock market. I don't know what kind of companies are in there. But let me put it this way, it's high, higher probability of finding value there than in GE. 
And, uh, and so that's the name of the game, is basically uh, go to where the fish are, where you think the fish are, and, and then the patience and the discipline to, you know, look, look for, you know, kiss a lot of frogs before you get to a prince. Thank you. So. Hi, uh, so my name is Francisco, and uh, I actually had a question regarding uh, diversification. So I know your strategy is more uh, kind of like equity long value investing, um, but within like an ever changing world where industry trends might change or um, competitive advantages might disappear, um, what's your opinion on diversification? Like, um, how many stocks is enough for your portfolio, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. Uh, it depends on your degree of conviction. I mean, I would say very few of us can get to Munger's degree of conviction where two stocks are ninety-four uh, percent. But you know, uh, you know, Charlie Munger says that if if you owned uh, in a small town in America uh, the McDonald's franchise and the Ford dealership and the best office building in town and the best apartment building in town. Let's say those are the four assets you had. And you could own fractions of them. So you may not be rich enough to own all four completely, but you could own 5% of a McDonald's or 7% of a Ford dealer or something like that. His perspective was that a portfolio uh, which had those four assets in a place like, let's say, Peoria, Illinois, middle of nowhere, uh, would be enough to make you quite wealthy over a lifetime. Uh, and, and so if, if, you, if some person looked at that portfolio, they would say there's extreme geographic risk because everything is in one town, right? But you know, if you meet any entrepreneur in Irvine, uh, let's say some Chinese couple running a small Chinese restaurant, uh, nearly all of their net worth is in one asset, uh, not even four assets, uh, in one town, right? And, and so that's probably even more risky than uh, what, what Munger suggested, Peoria, et cetera. So I think the, the answer on how many stocks or how many positions is a function of how well you know the companies and, and how durable those moats are. And you are right that uh, over time, almost all moats erode. You know, almost all companies lose their competitive advantage. I mean, uh, the Ford dealership, uh, I don't know what that looks like in 20 years. Uh, you know, maybe 10 years it's okay, but 20, 25 years it may be fine. I can't tell. Um, uh, McDonald's might, might, might still be there, but we, again, we don't know. You know, food is an area where if you get to things like what happened with Chipotle, uh, you, can, you can hit some, uh, some brick walls. So, uh, so I would say for the mere models like us, uh, not the mongers of the world, I think if you got to probably something like 10 stocks that you understood really well in a few different industries, uh, that's plenty. Uh, I don't think you should get to 50 stocks in a portfolio. I think that's not going to help you. Uh, but uh, something like you know, 10, 15, or 8 or something is probably a good number. Thank you. Um, sure. Hi, so uh, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm an undergraduate here at Palm Mirage. And I, my question simply was, what is the most valuable piece of advice you have received over the course of your career? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about that, okay? Because uh, there's a uh, uh, lot of different uh, uh, kind of uh, things that have come across in my, in my career, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll get back to your question maybe after the next question. In the meantime, I'll give it some thought so I not rambling off something that just comes off to my top of my head. Yeah. 
So my question is, um, it seems like investing really takes up a lot of your time and just like running your foundation and everything you do. How do you manage to balance your life in terms of family, personal time, and everything else? Okay, well, that's an easy one. You know, uh, my wife isn't here, but if she were here, uh, she would say uh, he doesn't work at all. <laughs> if you asked him what he does, she would say he does nothing. Uh, because uh, her perspective is uh, she really sees me do nothing, quite frankly. And my daughter's at the back. Uh, how do I, what do I do? How, how do I spend my time? I sleep. <laughs> there you go. So I, 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 I uh, in fact, just before I came here, I finished my afternoon nap. Uh, and so afternoon naps are a good thing. And uh, so I'm, I'm wide-eyed and very cheery for all of you. Um, yeah, so I actually, um, uh, you know, uh, investing is an activity that uh, at least as defined by Buffett and Munger and such, is not, an act, is not something that has a lot of, uh, you know, hyperactivity about it. It's an activity that requires a lot of reading and thinking, which is fine, and, uh, and I enjoy that. So actually, I don't even think of it as work. I think of it as fun, really, just trying to understand uh, the way things work and the way the world works and, uh, and so on. And, um, so, um, so I think that um, um, if, if, you, if you focus on doing things that you love to do, then you won't work a day in your life. And, and I think that should be the objective. I think the objective all of you should have is to focus on now, you know, for some of us, it's hard to figure out what we are excited about. Right? I mean, uh, sometimes that's not clear. It may not be clear at your ages uh, what you're excited about. But, uh, you know, increase time on activities that energize you and decrease time on activities that don't energize you. Um, and so, so, for example, you know, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Buffett and Munger say is that if you spend time with people who are better than you, you will get better. And if you spend time with people who are worse than you, you will get worse. There's a magnetic pull both ways. So one simple thing to, to look at is, if you look at your kind of close friends and who you spend time with, just ask the question, you know, are these people I really admire and look up to, or is so-and-so someone who's kind of pulling me down or has got uh, some negative attributes and such. And so if you change your social networks to be more in terms of uh, a, a, a crowd that is uh, kind of interesting and, and ones that you look up to, uh, that's going to be helpful. Uh, so I think these are just things that you've got to feel out and figure out what you're excited about, what you love doing, and then take it from there. And uh, you know, to answer your question, uh, I don't know whether it's, it's, it's advice, but I would say that there are, uh, what I would say, uh, the important thing for me is certain mental models. And some of them came about from, uh, you know, people, some of them I read about and different things. And these mental models have been uh, very important. Uh, so, for example, uh, one of the mental models uh, that I think might be useful to this group is that um, there, are, um, there are 168 hours in a week. And when you start working full time, uh, your employer is expecting you uh, to show up for around 40 hours, 40 or 50 hours or something like that. And if you live close to where you work, then you won't have much time with commutes and such. And even if you take out time for everything else, you know, eating, sleeping, and et cetera, there's probably at least another 40 hours available to you for other activities. Um, you can spend it a number of different ways. And uh, one way that the second 40 hours can be spent 
is it can be spent on your passions, if you will. Uh, it could be spent on getting a startup off the ground. It could be spent on, in Sanjay's case, investing that 5,000, so in 10 years it becomes 25,000. Right, so there's, there is a chunk of time all of us have. And uh, in my case, uh, you know, I only had one employer, but when I knew I wanted to uh, do a startup and leave, uh, I, didn't, I didn't just leave because I didn't have any money. I used this mental model. So what I did is I basically reduced my intensity of work uh, for the employer to be just above firing level. You know, I was no longer in interested in being employee of the month or employee of the year or anything like that. I wanted to take it down where I was just above, uh, that he's not so bad that we're going to fire him, but that's about all we're going to get out of him. And I spent all the time, the, you know, early morning before I went to work, in the evenings when I came back and weekends, on getting my startup off the ground, right? I put all my energy there. And it took about nine months of running this kind of dual life uh, by which time the startup had some revenue, I had two, three mon months of visibility, and I resigned. And, um, and when I resigned, uh, my, uh, my boss said, you know, we couldn't figure out what happened to you in the last six or eight months. <laughs> I said, yeah, exactly. I said, you know, my, my, my point was to just, you know, focus. He said, yeah, it wasn't so bad that he wanted to fire you, but you were just gone, there was like, you know, this is something missing. I said, I said, that was exactly the point. I wanted to be just about firing level. And um, so the, the, the mental model of that you can do two things at one time uh, within the same week is an important one. The mental model of understanding that compounding is the eighth wonder of the world is an important one. Um, there are a few of these models uh, which basically become important. Another, another mental model I probably got late in life, probably when I was in my mid-30s, is that humans, uh, <coughs> humans want the truth. They don't particularly care what it is. Uh, so, for example, let's say I did something uh, untoward or negative, or I had some results that were uh, not that great. Uh, if I am absolutely candid about owning up to those, generally speaking, as humans, we know that we are subject to screw-ups. Uh, and so the, something that I didn't understand was that people don't particularly care that you screw up. Uh, what they care about is that you're candid about the screw-up. And, uh, and so what I found is that when you have candor around screw-ups, uh, you strengthen relationships and you actually deepen trust and all those things have huge positive impacts long term. So these are, you know, I think that uh, Munger is kind of, what I learned from Charlie is to be a collector of mental models. And the, one of the reasons why these mental models become important because our brains are kind of very screwy in terms of how we process things. There's a lot of kind of... Uh, uh, glitches in it. And so these mental models help us get around uh, a lot of these glitches. And uh, so, so that's kind of what I would say is uh, some of the things to, uh, to think about. So, yeah, go ahead. I actually was um, going to ask a similar question like her did. So because as I know, as an entrepreneur, it's really hard to balance the work and life, but I think you already gave the perfect answer for that one. So another question I have is, um, I'm interested in that, did you like, have any investment in China's market? And how do you think about that? I, I, do, I do have, uh, I think we have one investment in China and the one investment in Hong Kong. And uh, I mean, these were, uh, uh, the Hong Kong one was, uh, was easier because uh, there was, everything was in English, it was easy to kind of go through it. Uh, uh, the Chinese one, I got some hand-holding uh, from some benevolent Chinese people, which is great. Uh, but, uh, but no, my, my biggest handicap with those markets is to a large extent it falls into hard pile. Uh, so I, I would say you would probably have 
a serious advantage over me on the Chinese market and, uh, and such. So the, the important thing, I think, in investing is uh, uh, you know, to always stay within circle of competence and always uh, focus on things that you really understand. You know, uh, Munger gives the example of uh, one of his friends who's a billionaire, uh, John Ariega. So John Ariega only invested throughout his career uh, in real estate within a few blocks of the Stanford campus. So uh, his whole career, that's all he did was uh, uh, make investments around us. And usually he was buying when things were uh, pessimistic and he was selling when they were euphoric and those sorts of things. And he never over levered. And over time, those investments did really well. So if you think about kind of circle of competence of a person like John Ariega, well, it's not even real estate. It's not even California real estate. It's not even Northern California real estate. It's not even Bay Area real estate. It's real estate just around Stanford. And so a person who just understood real estate around Stanford from a standing start becomes a billionaire, right? And so that's kind of the nature of the, of the world is that specialization is a huge advantage. And so even something like the Chinese market is probably too broad. Uh, so I think uh, the narrower you can get and the more intensity you can bring to it, uh, the better off you're going to be. And uh, so that's, that's the key is within circle of competence and uh, depth of knowledge in there. So. Okay. Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm also an undergrad here. Um, and I noticed that one of your investing principles is that to invest in high uncertainty companies. Um, and notice that in markets, people often um, interpret um, high uncertainty as high risk. I'm just wondering how would you differentiate or um, how would you interpret the idea of high uncertainty and high risk? Sure, well, that's a good question. So um, risk and uncertainty are two different things. Um, and uh, markets many times get confused between the two things. So, so for example, uh, if I were to, uh, let's, say, let's say, look at a funeral services company, you know, company focused on either cremating or burying the dead, um, and let's say they're in certain geographies, uh, we don't know who's going to die in Peoria, Illinois next year, but we know how many are going to die. Okay? So if you want a predictable business, there is probably no more predictable business than a funeral services business in Peoria. Okay, I can tell you 10 years from now what the cash flows are gonna be, even 20 years from now what the cash flows are gonna be. Right, so a business like that exhibits no uncertainty. Right, it's, it's a very low uncertainty business. Uh, and generally speaking, businesses with low uncertainty tend to be fully priced. Uh, it's, they almost become like bonds, you know, because, uh, I mean, if you have, if you have a, a real estate investment trust, it has a set of class A properties in prime locations, 95% leased, uh, the economy is doing well, you can see those cash flows for a while, uh, and, you know, it's got a lot of stability to them. On the other hand, there are businesses uh, which, by their very nature, are subject to very high uncertainty. So for example, let's say they were an oil company, right, where the revenues and cash flows are very dependent on the price of oil. They haven't hedged anything. Or let's say there's a shipping company uh, which has got its entire fleet on uh, daily charters, if you will. And again, uh, in some cases, those charters can vary so much that you can get very high uh, deltas in, in what the cash flows can be. So one of the cues in investing is that one should look for situations where you get the combination of the two, where you get a combination of very low risk and very high uncertainty. So when you, when you see an example of the two together, uh, the odds are very high that you can make a lot of money. So I'll give you an example uh, I think this was in uh, 2000, uh, in 2001, uh, 
there was a company uh, I invested in, it was called uh, Frontline, it was a shipping company. And uh, what they did is they transported crude oil. So they had these VLCCs, very large crude carriers, which are transporting oil between, let's say, Saudi Arabia and the US and so on. And uh, these crude carriers are huge ships. You know, at that time, they cost about $70, $80 million a piece. And uh, there, uh, there are two ways that people use these ships. They either do uh, leases, you know, kind of time charters, or they're on the spot market. So in the case of Frontline, they had something like 40% of the global fleet of VLCCs, and they were all on the spot market. So on the spot market, uh, VLCC's range of daily rates varies from something like $10,000 a day to a quarter million dollars a day. It's a huge variance. And uh, break-even price for these ships was at that time about they had to make at least 20 or 25,000 a day to break even. So what had happened in uh, 2001, I think in 2001, 2002, when I was looking at Frontline, is the, there was a, a glut of ships, uh, too many ships, and not enough crew being shipped, shipped around. Uh, and so as a result, shipping rates had collapsed. And uh, at that time, shipping rates were around 10 or 12,000 a day. So Frontline's fleet was losing money. And uh, the stock price uh, went down to something like $3 a share. So these ships also have uh, active market of being bought and sold. So I could look in, for example, Clarkson's was a publication. I could look at what the distressed selling price of these ships was at that time. And if the entire company just sold everything at a distressed price, they would get something like $11 a share. Uh, so it was trading at you know, huge 60, 70% discount to liquidation value, mainly because there was fear, right? I mean, this is like, the, there's, the, there's kind of the midnight of the oil shipping business, if you will. And um, now the, the other nuance, you know, we, we talked about mental models. Uh, since we have some time, I'll just make this a little bit more detailed. Uh, there's a friend of mine who uh, is in the real estate business, and uh, you know he was telling me that Class A office towers in major urban areas uh, normally take three to five years from the time someone thinks about them to the time they're ready. It takes a long time. And usually what happens in the real estate business is that when occupancy gets really high and uh, vacancies are very low in these class A towers, everyone and their brother plans to build them. But the thing is it takes three to five years to build it. By the time they get built, they all hit the market at the same time and then everything collapses. So in, in these real estate uh, towers, you have this boom and bust cycle going on because they're like lemmings, you know, when everything's jamming, everyone and their brother is building, and they all come on the market at the same time. The VLCCs are very similar in the sense that uh, it takes a couple of years, two years, three years, to get a VLCC built in a Korean shipyard. And usually when the rates are really high, you know, 80,000, 100,000 a day, everyone and their brother places orders. And what happens is that on a $70 million VLCC, you can place an order by giving them two million or a million. You know, you don't have to put up a lot of money, just, it's like ordering a Model 3. Thousand dollars gets you the Model 3. And um, so on the other side, uh, when rates go to 10,000, nobody wants to place orders. You know, there are no orders being placed, just like there are no towers being built. And so what happened in the VLCC market is when these rates go to like 10,000, scrapping increases because they can scrap the ships, the old ships, and get a lot of instant cash uh, from the steel value. So what happens in the VLCC market is that when these ships, there's a glut of these ships, there's excessive scrapping taking place. But when those ships get scrapped and then the demand comes back up, 
you cannot instantly have more ships. And so the only thing that happens is the price changes. So I, I bought uh, Frontline, I just wanted to capture the uh, liquidation value spread, so I bought it at three, four dollars, and it, you know, eventually got up to, as the rate started going up, it got, got up to eight or nine dollars. It was still below liquidation value. I sold the stock, I think in six months, I doubled my money or whatever else. But then, but then the second part, which I missed, came to bear, which is there weren't enough ships. Rates went to a quarter million. They're sitting there with 40 ships, and eventually the stock was a 200 to one. You know, so if I had been like Sanjay and I just put my 5,000 there and just, you know, gone away, that would have been the thing to do, and, and such. So, um, so I think that that was a case of very low risk and very high uncertainty because of those dynamics. And so if one is kind of a student of these things, uh, you can find these kind of weird things in different industries. And uh, it's, it's a fun hunt when you find them, uh, to look at them and such. So, uh, so that's what I would, I would suggest. We had, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Michael here, uh, undergrad here at Palm Mirage. Um, so you've been talking about this for the past hour, um, but you've been stressing a lot about the importance of patience, uh, even when the market is down. Um, but in your experience, have you witnessed like any historical indications that continue to repeat uh, during your career that um, prompt you to uh, not exercise patience, to actually act? Well, I think this is a business where you have to combine extreme patience with extreme decisiveness. You know, it's kind of a weird combo. But what you need is uh, an ability to sit there long periods do nothing, and then when the opportunity is there and it's obvious, you act in size. So you really have to have the two together. And I think that's why, to some extent, I think that uh, it may be difficult, depending on genetic makeup, to completely reprogram someone. To some extent, someone has to be predisposed uh, to some of these traits. And then, then I think you can build on it from there. So that's what I would, I would say, that you just need a combination of the two, a uh, combination of the patients. Uh, and and uh, one of the reasons I, I even like to give talks like this is that it helps reinforce for me uh, the importance of patients. Um, as I'm saying it to you, it helps me get better at that. And, uh, and so, so the, the patience and decisiveness uh, need to go together, and uh, and that's it's not easy. I mean, I think the thing is that uh, you've got to have this, you know, extreme action at one point in time, with no action for long periods of time, and that's that's just a difficult combination uh, to put together. But that's that's what is required. Hi, I'm Keo Beverly. Uh, uh, MBA student at the uh, Paul Morales School. Um, so I was really intrigued by hearing that every day you receive a few tips sometimes from people you've never had interactions with. As someone who's not employed in the investment industry um, and someone who's just starting to kind of begin their career with personal investment, I was wondering if you had any tips for a way to kind of broaden my network uh, to meet people who are investing to kind of get more information and, and kind of bounce ideas off of people. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think one way you could do that is you could reach out to people uh, with perhaps your write-up of your best idea and, uh, and say, hey, you know, if you find this of interest, uh, we could chat, et cetera, and take it from there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, uh, some ways to broaden the network might be to go to places where some of the like-minded folks hang out. So I don't know if you've been to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting uh, in Omaha. I would say that's a good place to go and it'd be a good place to go and get early in line because usually the people around you, or even in the airplane, I think most of the people will be heading there. Or uh, Professor Yang attends the Daily Journal meeting in February usually. That's another good place to go that's local. 
So I'd, I'd say that there's uh, a few places where the groupies hang out. There are some message boards, and I think some of the message boards also have people who meet up. I think there's one called uh, the Corner of Berkshire and Fairfax is a message board, and uh, so sometimes people on the message board will meet. And uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that uh, in this day and age, you've got a lot of digital tools at your disposal that can get you to some groups online, and then you can take that further from there. So. Hi, uh, my name is Ken. I'm an undergrad student and at Pomerash, and I just have a quick question about uh, would you keep the same uh, investing strategy under President, President Donald Trump's administration, and how would you address that? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, uh, the good news with the U.S. is uh, our presidents have very little power. Uh, so, uh, so uh, in the entire history of the United States, uh, we've got we've had a lot of pathetic presidents. Uh, we probably had more pathetic presidents than great presidents. If you if you think back to yourself, you know who were the great presidents. You probably might not even get to all the fingers on two hands. And uh, so, uh, I don't. I'm not necessarily convinced President Trump is not going to be a good president. Uh, time will tell. Uh, but I would, I would just say that I don't make investment decisions. I don't think I've ever made any investment decision based on who's in office. Uh, I think, quite frankly, uh, where Dehan Flower is trading in Korea has nothing to do with who's in, who's in power. Uh, it has no, no relevance. Or where Frontline is trading, or any of these other dynamics, it has really got nothing to do with who's in power. And uh, so, so I've never made investment decisions. And I think it's a stupid idea to make investment decisions uh, based on, uh, based on you know, who's, in, who's in power, especially, I think, given uh, our US system of those strong checks and balances. Uh, I mean, there's, uh, uh, there's natural tendency to inaction. Uh, unless a lot of parties agree. And, and we've seen that over eight years in the Obama administration. Uh, we are seeing some of that right now. And some of that is a negative, uh, way because we need, sometimes we do need action. But the remarkable thing about the US is that at specific points in time, when everyone needs to come together, like during the financial crisis and different things and stimulus and all that, they magically happen to actually agree and do a few things, which is great. Uh, so, so I would say it's generally uh, a mistake to, uh, uh, to spend time. And actually, you know, this is one of these uh, kind of peculiar human traits is that uh, everyone uh, seems to, I think, spend too much time uh, on the nuances of President Trump. It's probably entertaining. Uh, to spend that time, uh, but quite frankly, that uh, it's not going to help your net worth. I heard you mention the passing about the one word, over lever or leverage. And I know that's a very dangerous word when it comes to investment. So can you share a little more on that and whether it's ever, ever a good idea to use leverage to invest? Yeah, I would say the I would say the short answer is probably a good idea to avoid it. Um, uh, I I do know that uh, you know even someone like probably Charlie Munger used leverage in the very early days. Uh, probably has no desire to use it at this point or even for the last several decades. Uh, so I think the simple answer is that it's probably best. Uh, I mean, there can be situations where leverage may make sense. Uh, but I would say the, if one never uh, used leverage, uh, that would keep you out of a lot of trouble. So I think generally speaking, uh, you know, the, the thing about the, uh, the power of compounding is uh, there are really three elements uh, which control kind of, you know, what your end number ends up being. So one is you know, the amount of money you start with. The second is your rate of return. And the third is the length of the runway. Right? So the combination of those three elements 
get you to the end result. And uh, the most controllable one of those three is the length of the runway. Uh, because the thing is, especially for most of you in the room, if you're in your uh, early 20s, uh, you have a, probably a 60 or 70 or 80 uh, year runway. And, and the important mental model there would be spend less than you earn. And, and even if you didn't get spectacular rates of return, if you use the entire runway length, uh, you're going to get a spectacular end result. And so, so for example, um, you know, uh, I think this was, a, uh, I think maybe a year ago, uh, maybe 18 months ago, I was, uh, I picked up my younger daughter, she goes to school at NYU, and it was late at night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, we were driving back to my LAX, and um, I thought this was a good time to explain the magic of compounding to her. And um, so she had just uh, done an internship uh, the previous summer, and uh, she had made $5,000 that summer. And uh, the, the IRA laws allow you to put all of that into uh, an IRA, and, uh, which, which I had asked her to do and we had done. And then I told her, you know, I said, you know, the, the thing is that your, uh, your 20, for example, uh, and uh, actually she did that, I'm sorry, that internship was uh, when she was 18. So I said, you're 18, you got this 5,000. And I said, what is the value of this 5,000 uh, when you're, for example, uh, 60, 65 or 70 years old, for example. And, uh, and I said, let's say, for example, um, the returns are decent. Let's say you're doing about 15% a year, for example. So one of the mental models is rule of 72, uh, which is if you're doing 15% every five years, the money's gonna double. And uh, so if you go from 18 to 68, uh, that's 50 years. Uh, and if you're doubling every five years, it's two to the power of 10. And my daughter is falling asleep while I'm doing all this math for her. And, um, and two to the power of 10 is 1,024. And uh, so if you throw away the 24, uh, the 5,000 becomes 5 million, uh, tax deferred. At this point, she was wide awake, okay? <laughs> so I said, you know, that, that 5,000 at 18, at 68 becomes 5 million. I said, but you know, at 19, you'll do another internship, maybe make another five, 6,000. And at 20, you'll do another one, and at 21, another one, and then at some point, you'll graduate, and you might have some savings that might be even maybe more than 5,000. So I said, all of this is getting saved and invested. What is the net worth at 68? And so she said, it's too large. You know, I can't do the math, it's too large. And the reality is that most humans don't get there, right? So most humans don't get to these, you know, huge numbers at, at, the, at those ages. Why don't they get there, right? So one is uh, when they leave their job, they take the 401k and they go on vacation. Okay, so you cannot, you know, one of the 11th commandment, thou shall not take the 401k and not roll it over. Okay, very important. You can't screw up the compounding engine. So, so you have to basically, I mean, the thing is the actions required to get to very significant sums without even earning that much money over a lifetime are very simple. Uh, the first action is that uh, you consistently spend less than you earn. And the second action is you, even if you don't know investing, just put it in an index fund and forget about it. And uh, so even if, you're not, even if you're not compounding at 15%, I mean, you could take the same number and say, let's say a double comes in 10 years. Even that is, that is fine. In, in a 50 year period, you'll get five doubles. Two to the five, power of five is uh, 32. And again, when you start doing that every year with, with all the numbers, you'll get to a big number. So, 
So that is the key, is you don't need leverage. Uh, you need to be aware of the fact that there are uh, magical properties to compounding, and there are negative magical properties to compounding if you borrow at high interest rates. So if you have credit card debt, then you're, the whole process is working in reverse, which is terrible. And uh, so don't have credit card debt, pay off the credit cards always, spend less than you earn, and start very early. It's, it's, if, you lose, if you lose your 20s and you start compounding in your 30s, that's a massive loss. That's a, that's a lot of lost opportunity. So I think you really want to uh, get started very early. So I have a really quick question. So you're saying that we shouldn't leverage, but let's just say we are a college student and we're just starting off investing. You probably start off with like 10 grand, less than 100 grand when you start. But the problem is if you want to trade, let's just say three times on, on a daily basis, you probably get hit with a T90 and you can't trade after that. And then if you want to do options, you can't do options because you have to open a margin account and then you can't provide safety. So when we can't lever because we don't have enough money, then how can we really invest if we have to wait for stock at the lowest price in order to see it rise up to the top? Like you're talking about frontline communications at five dollars, it amplified all up to two hundred, and then you have straight through com or straight path communications, the same exact thing, five dollars that also I guess amplified to two hundred dollars over the Verizon trade. So I'm just kind of curious for people who don't have as much cash flow, how do you go about investing? when you have so many constraints that block, I guess, um, small value investors? Right, well, I don't know where to begin with your question because we can't have an option account. And we can't have a margin account. Uh, we gotta get all that vocabulary out of our system. And I mean, I would say if you invert, you know, Munger says many problems get solved by inversion. Uh, so, you know, rapid traders, uh, how many rapid traders are there in the billionaire club? You know, it's like, you know, the thing is that, uh, and what percentage of rapid traders made it to the billionaire club? And the flip side is how many people who concentrated or did kind of one thing for a long time made it to that club, for example. So I think that the, the important thing is that uh, to be patient and not be in a hurry. Uh, I mean, I just pointed out that uh, uh, my daughter has 5,000. She does, makes nothing more for the whole life, earns 15% a year, which is every five years is doubling. She ends up with 5 million. So if you had 10,000, you don't need heroics uh, to get to uh, great numbers. You need patience. So that's what I would suggest is that uh, uh, take the patient route and, uh, and that might be the way. But uh, definitely I think that uh, some of the path that you might be contemplating, the problem is, the problem with those paths is that you will, or you have high probabilities of blow ups. Uh, you know, if you're levered or you're using options and all of that, uh, the returns look great. Uh, but so is the risk. Uh, and so what you really want is low risk and high returns. Uh, that kind of gets to high risk and high return. So probably best to uh, look at another, another way of doing that. Hi, Monish. Uh, this is Dave. Um, so I have <clears throat> two-part questions for you. Um, so as an owner-operator of insurance companies, um, and you know that the age of uh, autonomy, uh, autonomous vehicles is, is dawning. If you are an owner operator of an insurance company, would you start an insurance business, number one? Number two, as a shareholders of auto companies, um, at what point do you consider exiting the positions of your auto company, considering that there's ride sharing uh, platforms coming of age and so forth? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I didn't get the question about the insurance company. So, so the, quest, the first one was, if, 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 you were to, if you were to start an insurance company, would you start an auto insurance company oh, at yeah, the sure. age of autonomous vehicle? Sure. Yeah, so I think the auto insurance, uh, uh, 
well, that will be a pretty competitive market to try to go into uh, with all the players out there. So we'd have to have some mousetrap that uh, has some advantage. So uh, I'm not contemplating starting auto, auto insurance companies. I think that'd be a difficult one unless you came up with some, uh, you know, probably, uh, probably something like pet insurance has a better runway uh, than auto insurance uh, is my guess. But I would say that uh, uh, the, the autonomous driving and all the different facets of ride sharing and such, um, one of the things that happens with all of those different formats of transport is that miles driven or miles traveled per human are going up because of the flexibility and ease of the different options. So, uh, so for example, when I was a student, uh, uh, undergrad student, you know, I had a bicycle and uh, options for transport were very limited. But today, if you're a student, you have relatively cheap options of uh, Uber, rideshare, different, many different, you can rent a car by the hour, uh, you can do Uber pool, you have a number of different options. So in general, miles traveled increases. Uh, so as long as, 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 as cost of mobility drops, miles traveled increases. It, it becomes, so all of these I think are tailwinds for auto companies because if miles traveled increase, then eventually you have more usage of automobiles or more frequency of purchases. Where auto companies, I think, face disruption is when you get to autonomous, where there's no driver, uh, which is the definition, the industry definition would be level five uh, driving, which is uh, I get in my car, say, take me to granny's house, and it takes me to granny's house, and I don't have to do anything. And um, my, best, my best guess on that is that uh, the vehicles that uh, will eventually get there are unlikely to be dual mode. So they may not have the ability to have, you know, passengers or drivers and autonomous driving all in the same car, maybe separate uh, technologies that do that. And the second is that, uh, there's a huge difference between almost getting to full autonomy and full autonomy. So for example, if you say, let's say self-driving trucks, I think self-driving trucks can happen very quickly uh, because I can get a truck to a highway with a driver and then get the driver out of the truck in California and program it to go to New York. And it's all highway driving, it's relatively easy to write the code in the software and get the autonomy on that. But, and then at the, at the New York, at the last interstate, and again, a driver can meet the truck and take it down to where it needs to be. So the last mile on both ends can be human and the rest of it can be automated. And, because, and in trucking, it makes sense because you have hundreds of hours in the middle which is autonomous. So you can take a lot of cost out of trucking if you do it that way, and the ability to do that uh, is imminent, uh, that can happen. I think that when you're talking about all the different multitude of last mile nuances that we face, so for example, uh, I'm in Michigan, I'm in the middle of a snowstorm, I can't see the lane markings, I can't see anything, and I don't know how much confidence I'm gonna have in sitting in the back street of an autonomous car that is gonna get me to nirvana. You know, I mean, the, uh, you, you're starting to get to some issues. So I think that uh, it, in controlled environments, we may get to autonomy without a driver maybe in five or 10 years. Uh, in anything to anything, going anywhere to anywhere, sitting in the back seat of the car with no driver, uh, I think it's very far away. Uh, I don't know if we'll get that even in 10, 15, 20 years. We'll have to see because there are a lot of challenges. Getting to 99% or 99.5% uh, working is a big difference between that and getting to 100%. So that, that last one or 
is is a difficult proposition. Uh, but you know, I'm not I'm not a techie. This is my best guess at what's happening. So, in the time scale that we own auto companies, um, none of these are relevant. So, what I mean by that is, you know, I have a I have an investment in a company called Fiat Chrysler, and uh, we invested in it at a point in time where in a in a year or two, their earnings in a single year will exceed what we paid for the stock. Uh, so if I'm sitting on a cost basis of a P of one on 2018 or 2019 earnings, I really don't care what happens in 2025 uh, or 2030. So, so I think that uh, uh, from my vantage point, uh, it, it may actually, in the end, we don't know how it shakes out, but in the end, all these different mobility options may end up being tailwinds for the auto companies because they, they may end up increasing uh, the, the fleet usage on a, on a global basis. I mean, if I look at, look at my own usage, you know, I use Uber, but I also use my car. And there are times when my car is more, uh, more convenient than Uber. And sometimes when I'm in New York City, I use Via, which is great. Sometimes Uber Pool, et cetera. So it depends on the circumstance. And so I think that the fact that when people say, we, none of us are gonna own cars, and we're just gonna call cars when we need them, we are ignoring habit and cultural aspects. So the automobile is an entrenched part of our culture. Uh, we eat in our automobiles. Women put up makeup in their automobiles. We do a lot of things in automobiles. And we've been doing a lot of those things for a century. And it's a very personal space that we're used to. So I think that uh, I, don't, I, I find it unlikely that even in a world where every car is autonomous, that humans will cease to own cars. Uh, I think we still might want that personal space. And we might want to sometimes drive the car, and we might want it to, be, to drive us at times. So we may see different uh, combinations of, of that. And, um, but, but it's, it's very clear that if I take an Uber from Irvine to LAX today, for example, UberX, it's like 60 odd dollars, for example. If that same car didn't have a driver, it might be 10 or 15 dollars in cost. It would take the cost down a lot. Uh, because you'd be basically just, uh, you know, gas and maintenance and amortized cost of the vehicle. And so you would drop the cost a lot. So if you made trips from Irvine to LAX be very convenient at $10 door-to-door, -door, you would increase usage quite significantly. Demand would go up. And so as we drop the price of mobility, uh, so you know, how did mobility prices drop in the past? We had public transport, right? I mean, buses and commuter trains and all of that. And that has some convenience, it has some negatives. It, as you get these wide range of uh, different options, ride sharing, cars by the hour, and, and, and pooling and autonomous and such, uh, I think that miles driven by humans would skyrocket. And uh, so one way to play that, which is probably better than the auto companies, is uh, the no-brainer way to play that is the tire companies. So no matter what happens with the trajectory that we're on from 2017 to 2035, there is no question that every year from now, there will be more tires sold than the previous year because miles driven are going to go up. And, and, and especially with, let's say, electric cars, uh, you know, electric cars always try to reduce their weight, so they make the tires really thin uh, because they want uh, to maximize the distance. And so the electric car tires burn out really fast. 
uh, much faster than the normal tires. So that's even better for the tire companies. So the way to play this, in my opinion, is the tire companies. And, uh, and then, you know, I found uh, just like the, the, the person who sent me that idea, which was the, the 10X, another very nice human sent me a tire company. And God bless him. And, and this tire company was at two and a half times earnings. And uh, so I didn't have to think much, you know, because at two and a half times earnings in a market that's growing, we love that. The, the problem is it trades by appointment. It's very thin volumes, obscure company. You guys have probably heard of it, but, but the thing is that, you know, in a $560 million fund, I get uh, sometimes $1,000 of the stock. Sometimes I get $2,000 in a day. Sometimes I get zero. But I've been nibbling. I'm just continuing to nibble. And uh, now I have, I think, I, I think we've got about $4 million so far. But we just keep nibbling at it and see where we can get. So I, I'm excited about that one. So we'll take the, we'll take the last question over there. Oh, Hi. Uh, I'm an MBA student from South Korea, and then you talked about South Korea, and the South Korean stock market is very relatively cheap at the moment. You have a huge advantage. Yeah, <laughs> and highly <laughs> discount, uh, discounted at the moment. So what do you think the main reason is of that? And then do you think someday it's going to be recovered from the discounted price? I thought maybe you would educate me on that. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder what you're thinking. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not an expert on the South Korean market. I think they, the one part which I think is kind of uh, an irrational part of the market is the Korean preferreds. And uh, so the Korean preferred basically are economically similar to the normal common stock. Uh, the only difference is the voting rights are not, I mean, uh, Korean preferreds usually have little or no voting rights. But usually for many of them, the economics are the same. But in many cases, they are trading at half or a third of the equivalent common. And, and so uh, one simple thing to look at is perhaps a basket of the Korean preferreds. Uh, so Korean, so what? Korean? The Korean preferred stocks. Preferred. You know, the, uh, because like, like, let's say for example, Hyundai Motors. So you can buy the Hyundai Motors common stock, but you can also buy the Hyundai Motors preferred stock. And if you pull up the stock prices and charts on the two of them, there's a huge difference. And th the difference should not exist, or the difference should be very small, because the only difference is the, the voting rights. And so in a efficient market, I mean, uh, let me take the example of Google. Google has two classes of stock. One, I don't know, closed at 990 or something today, and the other one closed at 970 or something. Uh, one has more voting rights than the other. The difference is 2%, for example. Uh, in this case, the difference is huge. And one of the reasons the difference is huge, I think, is because the Korean people uh, kind of look at the preferred with some disdain because they, were, they came out during the crisis. And so they don't, it was part of the bailouts and such, so there's a taint to them. My understanding is there's a taint to them when the local Korean population looks at those preferreds. So I think you may be in a better position to understand why Korea trades where it does. Uh, part of it is, you know, there's a transformation going on right now with the chaebols and the power and I mean, uh, there was a lot of abuse in the past. Some of that is getting cleaned up. Uh, part of it may be the person 40 miles north of Seoul. You know, there's some issues there. So, uh, but I would say that's a good hunting ground. I'd say South Korea, especially among the preferreds, the small caps and such, I think there's some, there's some very good value there.
I find the South Korean uh, situation kind of peculiar because when I look at, I was recently in Seoul, uh, when I look at the, um, the price of the real estate, uh, it's ridiculous. It, I, I don't know if any, part, any place in the world is as expensive as, uh, you know, like some of the, like I, I was looking at that piece of land in Gang, Gangnam that Hyundai bought. Uh, I mean, that's, that's incredible. Uh, so on one hand, you have one particular asset that is very highly priced, uh, which is also sitting 40 miles from the DMZ, uh, but other assets in that same area are mispriced, in my opinion. So it's kind of interesting to see that. But I think that you have some advantage. I would focus in your backyard. OK, thanks. All right. OK, hey, well. Thank you very much. Round of applause. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, hang on to these. They might have some value in the future. Because this was what, what happened to that 60 million that never got cashed. <laughs> OK, thank you all for coming. All right.